Okay, so uh, hopefully you've read a little bit about Fusion. Let me wrap it up for you in a little bit. And uh, it's really interesting to me to think about how Fusion has affected really who you are. So let me explain what I mean by that. So uh, Fusion is also a very active area of research. So if, uh, if you have any interest in, in, in chemistry, one of the areas that uh, is probably very likely to be active for the duration of uh, whatever career you might have, that um, studying fusion and uh, nuclear combination of, uh, of elements is, uh, is going to be an active area of research for some time to come. So um, just a, a couple of reminders here. So at this point, you should be able to interpret these sorts of reactions. So in the first one, I'm showing a fission reaction of uranium-236. This is breaking down into barium-144 and uh, krypton-92. And it's also producing three of these things that are have a mass of one and a charge of zero. So it's a neutron. So we'll give it an, and it also produces some energy, right? So you know, think about this. So this is this is pretty much how a nuclear reactor works. Right? We take uranium and we break it down and we end up with energy. Think about fusion though as well. So a fusion and uh, an example of fusion is to take hydrogen, one proton, mass of one, and combine it with another hydrogen. And we make out of that essentially a heavy hydrogen and this electron. So hopefully you recognize that electron as a beta particle. And this also produces energy, right? So think about this, right? So we split things apart and we get energy and we stick them together and we get energy. So uh, yeah, something seems a little bit weird about that. But size really matters here. So uh, we, have to be, uh, we have to be careful. So these are two valid processes. Uh, this first one we use to generate energy here on Earth. And the second one, this is how the sun generates its energy through uh, this fusion process. Mostly of hydrogen joining together produces a tremendous amount of energy. So the way that the chemists look at this is called uh, binding energy. So the amount of energy that holds something together is also exactly the same amount of energy it takes to break something apart. So uh, we, call this, uh, we call this binding energy. And this is one way of looking at this. So here we've plotted every single element. And we said, well, you know, how much energy does it have inside the nucleus? Or more or less, you know, how much energy can we get out if, if we combine it? So, uh, so this is a way of looking at uh, how much energy gets released. So, so an example here that we just walked through. So I take hydrogen one, and I convert that to hydrogen two. You know, I get out of that you know this much energy. So as I go higher on this graph, I'm releasing energy. So uh, if I go from uranium two thirty eight to I don't know plutonium, right? so I'm going to be releasing energy if I go in higher on this graph. And you notice something about this graph. So hopefully you notice two things about this. So first of all, there's a peak here. So if I take big things like uranium and I make them smaller, moving to the left, I'll be releasing energy and, you know, a reasonable amount of energy until I get to iron. If I try to make things smaller than iron, that's going to cost me energy. So conversely, if I take things like hydrogen or helium and I combine them together to make larger elements, so if I combine a hydrogen and a helium, I'll make a lithium, and that releases that releases energy. So I go higher on this graph, and notice that that continues until I get to to iron element number fifty six. So. You may know what's at the core of the Earth, right? It's iron. Iron is super stable, so radioactively, so it doesn't want to break down. It doesn't want to join together. It's just happy being by itself. And uh, there's no coincidence that iron is really abundant in, in places like the center of our Earth, right? Second thing that's, that's kind of interesting to notice, that notice that uh, uranium turned into plutonium, right? I'm going to a very small distance of height on this graph, right? So we get a small amount of energy out of uh, decaying uranium. It's enough to run a radioactive <laughs> machine that provides power for hundreds, if not thousands of households, right? So, so what looks small on this graph is actually a huge amount of energy that we can harness to, to run our society. But notice that the larger amount of energy comes from combining together hydrogen. So if, you, if we can figure out how to combine together hydrogen and do this in a safe way, Right, good grief, we'll get a, a whole lot of energy out of that. And so this is the enthusiasm that there is for figuring out how to do fusion here on Earth in a safe way that allows us to get some energy out. So a couple of important things here. So one, iron's very stable. As big things break down, fission, they release energy. And as small things combine together, fusion, they release energy. Oops. 
and um, and that's represented roughly on this graph that shows uh, shows binding energy. So this is the way the chemists will look at it. So um, this is the the funky thing, and uh, we'll we'll take advantage of this a little bit. But if you can grasp that concept that things combining together, uh, if they're small, we take advantage of this inside the sun. It's also how a hydrogen bomb works that we're combining together uh, hydrogen and that's releasing a tremendous amount of energy, in that case, you know, destructive energy. Um, and uh, we hope one day to have fusion reactors. The challenge is how do you hold on to something that's producing that much heat? So we have fancy ways of levitating plasma, which is like another state of matter and trying to hold on to it. A really active area of research and people have all sorts of interesting ideas about how to get that to go. Um, and uh, of course, uh, uranium decay is the primary way that we use uh, that we use to get nuclear reactors. So it turns out the most common reaction in the universe is hydrogen turning into helium. And this goes through a few steps. So, uh, so I feel obliged in chemistry class to tell you what the most common reaction in the universe is, right? It doesn't happen here on Earth a whole lot, but uh, across the universe, this is really common. So, so think of suns. So uh, this goes through three key steps. So the first step is I'm taking two hydrogen and I'm producing a heavy hydrogen and an electron. So notice what I've done. I start with two protons all by themselves. Start with two protons. I smash them together, kick out a positron. So one of those protons turns into a neutron, right? So, uh, so this is a positron. So notice it's got a positive charge, just like an electron. So when I do that, I release some energy. Second step, I'm gonna take that heavy hydrogen and I'm gonna combine it with uh, normal hydrogen. And when I do that, I'll get this helium and produce some energy. And then finally, I'll take two of these light heliums, if you like, smash them together, and I'll end up now with a normal helium, right? So this is what we would call an alpha particle as well. So it's something that's got the mass, it's got two neutrons and two protons. So it's producing this helium nucleus and it kicks out of that a, hel a hydrogen just like it started with, another hydrogen just like it started with, and some energy. So notice there are three steps. Each of these steps produces energy. I've used up what, one, two, <laughs> three, then plus another three. So I've taken six hydrogen and I've ended up kicking back out two of them. So I end up using four hydrogens to really make this helium. Um, and again, every step produces a chunk of energy, and uh, that's what makes the sun so crazy hot, is that it is throwing out energy for all these steps. Okay, so, uh, so hopefully uh, this is giving you some idea of this chain of reactions. So just like we can have uranium that can decay through a series of chains of reactions, I can also have fusion that happens through a series of steps but it doesn't stop there, right? So I can combine hydrogen together to get to helium. And the hypothesis is that uh, at one time, there was nothing but hydrogen. Um, and uh, all of the elements that make life possible have come from fusion of hydrogen into larger things. So think about this for a minute, right? So what is it that forces things together, right? So this is just gravity that smashes things together and pulls them together. So if I have enough gravity to smash hydrogen nuclei together, if I have you know, larger mass, I can smash larger nuclei together. So I could smash two helium together and I can make something like boron. So there's nothing um, magical about these elements. Right? They've come from someplace. And almost all of these started out as hydrogen that then got combined together into make larger and larger elements. So gravity is key to this. So uh, as I, I enjoy these, these pictures. So this is Orion Nebula. If you look up in the night sky, you'll be able to see the belt of Orion. And then there's a sword of Orion as well. If you look on the sword, you can sometimes make out with your naked eye, but certainly with uh, binoculars or scopes, you can make out a nebula, which is just a dust cloud. Right? And dust cloud is sort of the birthplace of gravity and clumps come coming together. And if you get enough clumps, you can end up having a star. So the amount of matter that's there drives how much pressure there is and how much pressure drives the reactions that'll happen and the fusion that happens.
So uh, if you look up at the sky uh, around here during the summertime, I think uh, low on the horizon, so it maybe you have to be in a mountain, but uh, low on the horizon, you'll be able to see the brightest star, which is uh, called the dog star, star, also known as Sirius A and B, which is just a huge amount of mass, which has been compacted together and is now doing fusion, mostly with hydrogen, mostly with hydrogen, kicking out a ton of energy and that energy gets released, some of it in the form of electromagnetic radiation that we can see as light some distance. But there are other things going on as well. So going back to this, so this is our uh, star. You can think of it as a place where hydrogen turns into helium. So it's a helium generating factory. And as stars get, um, get hotter and older, they end up producing even more elements. In fact, all of the elements that are naturally found come from fusion that happen inside a star. So um, after some time, you end up having uh, iron that gets formed on the very core. Remember, it's the most stable one. Silicon will form further out. Oxygen will form further out. Um, and again, this is just the combining together of smaller elements. So my hydrogen will combine together to form helium. My helium will make beryllium. Beryllium and helium will make carbon. Carbon and helium will make oxygen. All sorts of combinations and breakdown products that can happen from that. But the key is that the things that you're breathing, the oxygen and, and the carbon, were actually synthesized inside a star. So we call stars really the, um, the factories for the elements that make up life. So there's a question though, so if an element is made inside a star, like how did it get here? <laughs> so there's a life cycle of stars, which is fascinating. I'm happy to go into it if you're interested. But, uh, but some stars that are appropriate size, once they burn out, they expand greatly and then collapse and explode. So this is called a supernova. And this has been observed several times. And probably during your lifetime, there will be a supernova. supernova. There's one that happened oh, maybe a couple centuries ago, and it was close enough and bright enough that it lit up the night. So it was uh, like having a full moon and uh, lasted for a couple of weeks before it faded away. So these supernovas, they, they, they take all the elements that have been synthesized inside that star, they spew it out across a large area, and now I have carbon and oxygen and nitrogen and all the things that life needs getting thrown out, and the cycle starts all over again, that we have some gas that comes together, it forms small clumps, the clumps will then get bigger, and eventually you'll have a rocky planet that now has all the ingredients that you need for life on it. So uh, oxygen comes from a variety of places, uh, and uh, the uh, there are a, uh, a, a, a there's a I guess great complexity into into the source of many of these. So uh, I I enjoy this diagram it was put together by an astrophysicist uh, at Ohio State, and uh, what it's showing here is where our elements really came from. So. Uh, the ones that are shown in blue, so hydrogen and helium, so all the hydrogen and, and a lot of the helium was uh, was made during the Big Bang when uh, we had energy that turned to matter and uh, maybe a little bit of lithium then. But everything else has been synthesized since then. So um, what's shown in, in green is what I described, which is the exploding massive stars. So many things like oxygen and fluorine and sodium, and most of uh, this area uh, of the periodic table, they came from exploding massive stars. Um, other things like carbon and nitrogen largely came from dying low mass stars. Um, there are some things that uh, like neutron stars, which are stars made up entirely of neutrons, right? You know what a neutron is. So imagine a star that has nothing but neutrons. There's no charge and there are no electrons. And so it ends up being a hugely dense star. So it, the average neutron, neutron star is going to be um, maybe the mass of our sun, but it would fit between here and Seattle. So within a 20 mile diameter, but has the mass of our sun, which is uh, taking up uh, over a thousand times the, the diameter of our current Earth. So um, incredibly dense things. Uh, and uh, some of these come from exploding white dwarfs and, and other things. So uh, there's a complex history to where these come from, but they all come from stars, well, outside of hydrogen and helium, and the various uh, life cycle that stars come from. So the elements 
that are here that are not hydrogen and helium um, have come from really fusion reactions that were happening inside ancient stars that are now long dead. Anyway, uh, it's, it's, I find it interesting to know where the elements came from. It gives you, uh, I think it's an interesting understanding of the periodic table. So um, I hope that's, uh, that's interesting to you. I think it's also um, uh, an interesting uh, explanation for this that uh, Neil deGrasse Tyson can do better than I can. So I encourage you to watch his short video which uh, describes uh, uh, what he thinks is the most interesting question that uh, he's ever been asked. Um, anyway, I hope this is helpful, and I'll talk to you soon. Bye.